Hi, so in this section we're going to talk about gear and what exactly do I take to a wedding and what would I recommend you at least have as a bare minimum when you start shooting a wedding. Um, like I said, there are different types of weddings and there are different types of levels of experience. And so in these, this course, we're specifically talking about when you first start out and you're first starting shooting those weddings. So sometimes when we are, I have the bigger weddings, I might take more gear, but I'm thinking that when you first start out, you're going to be shooting a hundred people less type of weddings, more intimate weddings. And so for those type of weddings, this is what I take um, to shoot. So the first thing I have is my case. Now you might be surprised. Um, one of my philosophies is this, is I want to travel as light as possible. The reason being that we shoot a lot of London weddings. Sometimes you're going from venue to venue. Sometimes you're having to use the train and I don't want to be lugging a load of gear. So I have got my gear down to a fine art and I take this case, which is not a camera case. It is a standard luggage case. The reason being, um, it's very light. So um, when you're going on a plane with hand carrying stuff, you want to make sure that you're taking as light as gear as possible. And secondly, it's light in terms of getting off trains and out, in and out of vehicles. It's really light. But what I like to do inside, I'm going to open it. Now, I'm a bit nervous about opening this up. It's like taking someone to your room for the first time. Did I clean it? I'm not sure. So I'm going to open this up and let's see what's inside it. So here we have it. Uh, and then in the first part are um, the gimbal, my gimbal. I call it the gimbal of love. Usually it sits in there. And my audio cables. I'll go into those in a minute. And then the one light that I have. And in here, in this compartment, are a load of cases. Now, I'm a big fan of these things called timber cases. Um, and the reason I like these timber cases is because they come, uh, with they come with soft padding inside. So they've got a lot of soft padding inside. They come with compartments, um, so you can compartmentalize your cameras and stuff. But the great thing about these is they protect your camera like a camera case, and but you can then use them in any bag that you want. So sometimes I have a rucksack that is just a standard normal rucksack. And the other great thing about that is being inconspicuous on, you know, on public transport and stuff. I don't want to bring attention to myself that I've got a load of camera gear. So being able to stick it in one of these and then and your lenses, your camera gear, and then be able to stick that in any bag like this is really cool. And then the other thing I really love are these Peak Design uh, bags. So I have these Peak Design pouches and I have two of them. One is a dark grey, which I know is for all my batteries. So any batteries I need go in this one. So anytime because on a wedding day, it's fast paced. And I don't want to be searching around going, okay, which compartment did I put stuff in? I want to know batteries are in the dark gray case and then light gray case, all sound gear equipment. So anytime I need anything sound related, it's in the light gear case. So this is my camera bag. And then the only other thing that I carry is this um, stick bag, this Manflow stick bag. Um, and inside it go uh, my, um, light stands. I'm going to talk to, about those in a minute. But the first thing, what would I recommend if you first starting out? So I would recommend you need a minimum of two cameras. Firstly, it's just, it's always good. You're going to find with weddings, it's always good to have backup, 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 even when it comes to the editing process. Can't say it enough. You always need backups. You always need to be shooting on two camera cards. So Minimum of two cameras. That way, if one goes down, you have another working camera. But for filming weddings, it's always good to have two different angles so you can cut between two different um, shots. Just like on this course, we've got two cameras going right now. We're cutting from a wide to a close up. And you know that just makes it more visually interesting, gives you options, gives you um, a way of hiding stuff um, if it happens. All right, so what camera do I shoot on? So. Um, I have two of these cameras. This is a Sony A7S III. It's my baby. Um, I know I said I'm a Sony ambassador, but even before I became a Sony ambassador, this was the, this was the one, the camera that we were all looking for. Why? Because for me, it's the perfect camera for shooting weddings for me right now. Why? Number one, small form factor. That's really important, I feel, especially in run and gun situations. What you want to be doing I want to be having a camera that's easy to hold, 
easy to pack away um, and really easy to hold. And the Sony A7S III comes in a, a magnesium body, so it's really robust and um, it makes sure that you know it's, it's gonna last, but at the same time, it's really lightweight. The other thing I like about it, it's really inconspicuous. So if I'm chatting to a guest, um, you'll, shoot, you'll see when we shoot the, the live wedding um, section. Well, I can say it now. I like to dress like a guest, and the reason I like to dress like a guest, guest at a wedding is I feel like it makes me part of the wedding day. Now, that's not to say you have to dress like a guest, but I like to dress like a guest. I also eat the canapes and get on the dance floor because I like to have a good time. But I feel like with doing that and then having a small camera makes me less of a cameraman. Um, and you're gonna see a lot of the things that I shoot, I shoot handheld. And so the reason that I love this camera is number one, it's small, okay? Now, let me just say something. Um, you don't have to shoot a Sony camera, but the thing I love about Sony is that this is a top of the line camera the thing I love about the company, and even before I became ambassador, is that a lot of the top gear stuff elements that they have in their top end cameras, even if you get the lower end cameras, a lot of that stuff filters down. They don't keep it out. So for example, Sony A7S III came out, great autofocusing system. The Sony A7 IV came out afterwards. Even though that's a cheaper camera and down the line kind of thing, it has an even better autofocus system than this camera. So, and it has features that even this camera doesn't have. So that's what I love about the company. Now, with that being said, you don't have to shoot Sony, but that's why I love the, comp uh, the company because I know that if I invest in this camera and then have to get some supplementary cameras that may be a little bit cheaper, I know the tech is gonna be um, great. Now, if you're shooting with two cameras, whatever co company you go with, I do recommend that they're the two of the same cameras. So for example, even if I, um, I have a Sony a7S III and I have another Sony, a, a Sony camera, I want to make sure that those two cameras are Sony a7S III's. Why? Um, because it just means when you're cutting from one camera to the other camera, it's the same footage. It's another less thing to think about. I can make sure my settings are the same in both cameras. So sometimes even though you have the same camera from the same camera company, be it Canon, Fuji, Nikon, Nikon, Sony, Two different cameras, but in the same um, same brand, sometimes can still look a bit different. Two different cameras from two different brands will definitely look a bit different. And when I first started shooting weddings, trying to match the footage between the two was a pain. So as again, you're gonna find that I like to keep things simple. Um, I'm the least technical person. And so I wanna make sure that I have the same camera so it's easy to cut between the two same footage. Now, what do I love about this camera? Again, because it's small. The other thing is it has two camera card slots. I would say, again, that's really important at a wedding. I would feel a little bit nervous about shooting a wedding if I didn't have two cards. And this takes um, CF Express A cards and it takes normal um, SD cards. I use the, um, the CF cards because they're faster and they're more robust. But if you wanna use SD cards, that's fine. Uh, the other thing I love about this Sony camera and the, the newer Sony cameras is they also have um, a USB-C port here. And that's really important because I never take my cards out of the camera. So I have very big cards. So the biggest card you can get on the CF Express card is 128 gig, I wanna say. We're gonna say it's 128, it's 160 gig. And yeah, 160 gig. And on an SD card, I think you can even go up to 512. So I never like to take the cards out of my cameras because A, I'm probably gonna lose them. B, I find as I take them in and out, that's how damage happens and then they get stuck inside the camera and that can damage the card slots. And C, I always get paranoid about whether I've backed up that camera, uh, that card. Whereas if I leave it in the camera and use the fast ASB-C slot to transfer data over, and because these Sony cameras have fast uh, USB-C transfer capabilities, it means I can transfer it as soon as I get over a wedding, leave it overnight, plug my two cameras in, I don't have to think about it. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, what cables I use and what a hard drive I have. Um, that's the other thing feature I love about this camera. So first thing, camera you, you're gonna choose two cameras. I would recommend that it's a mirrorless camera, so it's light. Number two, make sure it's got two camera card slots. And then the other thing I love about this camera, the Sony a7S III, and even the newer cameras, um, are that it has no record time limit. So some of the older cameras have a 30 minute time limit. 
um, on them. And that's really important to know because you do not want to get home from the ceremony that took an hour and find that your camera cut out after half an hour. So if you have an older camera, make sure you have a timer or watch that has a timer so you can press re-record again. But the good thing about the Sony a7S III is it doesn't have a time limit and it doesn't overheat. And that's really important as well. So some of the older cameras, again, you wanna be testing this, can overheat. So if it's a sunny day, if it's a wedding that's outside, they might overheat and you do not want that happening to your camera. The other thing I love about this camera is the autofocus. So the autofocus nowadays, back in the day when I first started, I shot on the a7S II, that didn't have very good autofocus and everything was manual focused. These newer cameras, and specifically the, the Sony, or, or, or Sony autofocus system, has eye autofocus. It's voodoo, man. And we're probably practicing now. You can see me moving. Is it tracking my eye? I'm talking to Charlie, the cameraman. It's still tracking my eye. So it's tracking my eye right now. And imagine that speeches, it's fantastic. Like I can set it on a, on, 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 a, on a tripod or my light stand, focus on the speaker. And I know even if they move a little bit, it's gonna focus on them. Even right now as we're doing this interview, I kind of trust the autofocus that even if I go back and forth, right to left, it's kind of tracking me and tracking that facial recognition. And that has been a game changer um, in, in terms of these cameras. The other thing I love about this um, camera is um, the fact that it's got, it's customizable, the dials. So I have a load of dials on here that I've programmed different functions. I, d I don't wanna be thinking about, the last thing you wanna be doing on a wedding day is thinking about your gear, if you can. And so I wanna be very quickly knowing that if I press this button, for example, if I press this button over here, it switches me from manual focus to autofocus. If I press this button over here, this is my clear image zoom, we'll talk about that in a minute. If I press this, if I go to the right on my dial, that's ISO. If I go, um, if I press this button here, the menu comes up and I can um, y y um, change settings on there. And then I think this button here, I can't remember, precisely is it's my white balance and that's really important to change as well um, and then you have a load this is customizable this dial at the top and then it has this nice little record button but you can also record from here so that's the other thing I love about this camera are the settings in it um, and then it has this flip out screen um, I really love this design um, I would highly recommend if you can get a camera with a flip out screen um, it might not necessarily be able to flip out like this one, but the great thing about this is like it means that you know you can get really interesting angles. So I can see the screen, I can raise it up top like this, and I can look at the screen here and be seeing if I'm shooting from a different angle. And it just gives me more creative options. Sometimes the cameras have the other screen that just flips out from the back. That's good also. It means you can shoot um, you know high and stuff like that. But I kind of like the flip out screen because it gives me an alternative angle. Also, if you're filming interviews and stuff like that, if you want to use it for commercial work, it means I can flip it out or vlog, I can flip it out the other way. Or if I want to do a cheeky thing on the dance floor with me and the bride, I can have a look and see what's there. So I love the flip out screen here. Now, the other thing I love about this camera uh, specifically is the, the actual codec that it records in. Um, it's fair to say that this has uh, you know, it shoots in 10 bit. That might be going, be going over your he head at the moment, but it's, it's good enough to use on commercial products, the, the codec on this camera, because it goes up to 10 bit. And so that just gives me more flexibility, specifically when it comes to 4K versus HD. Now this is something you're gonna have to think about when you're shooting. And I just wanna pause here to talk about 4K and HD. What is the difference between the two? Why would you film in one or the other? Now, HD is 1080p. It's the standard definition that we watch most things on TV. Um, and it's a certain size. It's 1080 pixels by 1080 by 1920, something like that. 1920 by 1080, that's what 1080p is. 4K, on the other hand, is almost three times the size of that. It's like 3,000 something pixels. So it's three times the size of HD. So what are the benefits of shooting 4K? Number one, it's gonna be in higher definition. So it means you're gonna get more definition, which could be a good or a bad thing, depending on the features that you wanna see. But B, it gives you creative options in terms of being able to crop. So I deliver, I deliver in HD. I can shoot in 4K. Why would I shoot in 4K? 
maybe I'm shooting the speeches on a wide angle and I want to give myself some creative room. I can crop in on 4K because I'm delivering in HD. Remember, it's three times the size of HD because my footage is so big, I can crop in and still not lose any resolution. The downside of 4K is that number one, it takes a lot of memory space. So remember how I never take my memory cards out on my camera? 4K is gonna use up a lot of memory space. It's gonna take longer to transfer over to your computer. And more importantly, when you edit, it's gonna take longer for your computer to churn through that footage. If you imagine a wedding day is 10 hours and you're getting through all that footage, it's all in 4K, that's gonna take way longer than HD. Now, the benefits of HD is that it's faster to use, faster to record in, faster to transfer. And B, on most cameras, it gives you a few more creative options. So, the thing I love about the Sony a7S III is you can shoot in 4K, 100 frames a second, and 50 frames a second, and stop. What does 120, 100 frames a second, 25 frames a second, 50, what does that all mean? It's basically slow motion. So standard frames per second is 25 frames per second. So any camera that you have, your iPhone, uh, if you turn this on when you first buy it from the store, it will shoot in 25 frames per second in PAL in the UK. If we're in America, it's 24 frames per second, NTSC, just to confuse you a little bit more, but that is what we watch in. Now, if you want to shoot in slow-mo, you need to be recording at 50 frames per second or 100 frames per second or basically more than 25 frames per second because when you have those frames per second, now, when you film in 50 frames per second or 100 frames per second, when you play it back in your camera or you play it back in your editing software or you play it back on the TV, it will look like 25 frames per second. You will not notice the difference. It's when you take it into your editing software and you slow it down, you will find there's more information. So if you took 25 frames per second and you wanted to slow it down, the footage would become jittery because there are only 25 frames per second. If we slow it down, there aren't enough frames to cover the gaps. However, if I'm shooting 50 frames per second and I'm on a 25 frames per second timeline and I slow it down, because there's double the amount of frames, I've got double amount of the information to slow it down. If I shoot in 100 frames per second, I've got four times the amount, so I can slow it down even more and go to 25% of my normal um, speed. So that's why we would choose a different frame rate. Now, I shoot the majority of a wedding in 50 frames per second. Why? You're gonna learn this soon enough. Slow motion is your friend. Why? Because sometimes there are a little, few little jerks. Sometimes you might pan and accidentally knock into something. Sometimes you, do, you make a mistake. Sometimes you're walking and there's a little bit of a judder. Slow motion will smooth that footage out. And the slower you can shoot it, the more you can kind of gloss over any mistakes. Also, Sometimes it's a little bit more cinematic, you know, the bride coming down the aisle, uh, um, uh, an epic moment, um, the couple in sunlight. Slowing that down, you know, gives you scope to kind of play with the edit or conversely speeding it up. But with, it's easy to speed up normal footage, but if you don't shoot in slow-mo, you can't slow it down. So I shoot the majority of the wedding day in 50 frames per second. Sometimes I can shoot in 4K, for speeches, because I might want to crop in. But the majority I shoot in 1080p HD because again, those clips are, uh, it's that fine balance between giving me creative in post in the edit to slow it down, but at the same time, good quality footage and at the same time, not being so big when we're transferring loads of file sizes. Um, and I save those settings to my dials at the top. So on here, I have dials one, two, three. I can, I, on dial one, it's, uh, I know it's 1080p at 50 frames per second. Dial two is 4K at 50 frames per second. Now, the thing I love about the Sony a7S III is it shoots in 4K 50 frames per second, 100 frames per second, 25 frames per second. HD, it shoots 25, 50, 100, even up to 240 if I shoot in S and Q mode. Um, so I have a range of creative options. Now, uh, I know that the cameras below it, things that you need to pay attention to are I would definitely, at a minimum, I'd probably, if you're gonna buy a brand new camera nowadays, you wanna make sure it shoots in 4K, because it's good to have that. Most likely, if it's an entry-level camera or it's below this, it probably won't shoot in 4K 50 frames per second, but it's shooting 25 frames per second, which is fine. It's just good to have 4K. 
but you definitely want to make sure that if it shoots in 4K, 25 frames per second or 50 frames per second, does it crop in? Some cameras, when you shoot in 4K, 50 frames per second, it crops in and you lose part of that image. So you just want to make sure that if your camera does that, you're aware of that. Now, the other thing is, um, I would say at a bare minimum, you want to make sure whatever camera you buy, it shoots in 1080, 50 frames per second. Again, that's going to give you more creative options. If it shoots in 100 frames per second HD, brilliant. You've got even more creative options. Again, this camera, don't have to think about it, does everything. So it kind of, that's fantastic. Uh, but when you're buying your camera, I would, I would want to make sure it shoots in 4K 25 frames per second as a bare minimum with no crop mode. And it shoots in HD 50 frames per second and um, as a bare minimum. So again, that's the thing I love about this camera. So we covered overheating, we've covered um, uh, autofocus, we've covered the dual card slots, form factor. The last thing I love about the a Sony a7S III and, and all Sony cameras in particular is they have this one trick up their sleeve. Now, I'm not trying to sell you a Sony camera, I'm just trying to say I use this all the time on a wedding day and it's called clear image zoom. And clear image zoom is some voodoo that they put in the camera. It's not digital zoom. So digital zoom is basically like on your iPhone when you press 2.5, it kind of zooms in. And basically what happens is when you zoom in, it degrades the image because it's literally digitally zooming in. Here, clear image zoom is if I have a, like say a 35 millimeter uh, lens on my uh, camera, with my clear image zoom, which I programmed to this button here, when I press that button and I get the dial in, it zooms in without losing, uh, quality and that 35 frames that 35 mil camera almost becomes like a 50 mil camera now i know it's not a 50, 50 mil lens i know it's not 50 mil i know it's cropping in but the versatility on that is amazing so if, for example if you shoot on something like a zoom lens from 24 to 70 70 i know at the top end that 70 mil if i use clear and zoom that almost becomes like 100 mil or maybe even 140, I don't know. But the point is, is like, it gives me versatility. And it's only Sony cameras that do that. Again, this is not an advert for Sony, but I use that all the time at weddings. So that's the other reason that I love this camera. And then finally, the last thing you wanna be thinking of, there's probably other few other things I've forgotten, but it's um, the pro, I love, the thing I love about these cameras is the picture profiles. So I like to shoot in camera as much as I can, as perfectly as I can in camera so that it saves me editing on the back end. But the great thing about um, uh, these cameras is that it has a, a plethora of options when it comes to picture profiles. So maybe you wanna shoot in uh, S-Log or if you're Canon C-Log or if you're on Nikon, I'm gonna take a big guess here, N-Log, it's the guess. Um, you, you can then grade that afterwards, I don't but I love the picture profiles in here because they look great coming straight out camera. I don't have to do hardly anything to them. The only thing I tweak is white balance. So again, when we shoot in the, wherever we're gonna be doing the ceremony, I'll show, you, I'll show you what white balance does. And I like to shoot how it looks in camera. So if it looks great in camera, then to me, it's probably gonna look great on a, like a TV screen. And then I just have to add very minimal uh, post-processing to get it to the look that I want. So again, that's why I love this camera. Um, it's a Sony a7S III. It is at the top end. It might be like a big of a jump for some people to get two of them. But again, like the thing I love about Sony is that a lot of this tech is in the, a lot of their lower end cameras. However, you don't have to shoot Sony. If you shoot Canon, it's fantastic. Nikon, Fuji, they're all great cameras. They all have a great load of great uh, load of features, but the number one thing you want to think about and be sure of is the time limit recording. Again, I would hate for you to get on your first wedding and didn't realize that it has a time limit on it and you're, you set press record and you get back home and you realize it's only recorded half the ceremony. So please, 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 whatever you do, check that out. So my cameras go in my Temba case, two of them go in my Temba case, they fit quite nicely um, and then they lock up and I can throw that into a rucksack. As you know, I put them in my case here. By the way, I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't have like a proper camera case. I just found that after a while, they just got damaged, they were heavy, I never used them, so I like this. My colleagues, my friends take the mic out all the time, the fact that I use this, but hey, it works for me, so. Um, so next, what lenses do I use? So this is the bigger Temba case, um, and this has all my lenses. So, 
I'm gonna talk about what lenses I use, but I also wanna take it from the point of view what lenses would I recommend for you. Now, um, I like to shoot with prime lenses. So prime lenses, for example, are fixed focal lengths. So for example, this lens here is a 55 mil. It's a Sony Zeiss 55 mil, meaning it doesn't zoom. It's a prime lens. Now, the benefits of prime lenses are most likely they go down to a, uh, is it lower? A lower aperture stop. So this goes down to 1.8. Most zoom, so here I have a zoom, which is a 24 to 70 zoom. This is a 2.8. I am a bit of a bokeh whore, i.e. I love bokeh. And bokeh is that effect that you get in terms of the, um, you know, when it's out of focus, that kind of blurry, creamy image when something's in focus and the thing behind it is out of focus. That's kind of bokeh. Um, and 1.8 gives you that creamy bokeh and 1.4, 1.2 gives you that creamy bokeh. Also, it means you can shoot in even lower light because you can open the lens up more. So we, again, when you're on the dance floor, shooting at 1.8 is way better than 2.8. And also, I love shallow, I've, I've probably said it twice, but I love shallow depth of field. I love that look. To me, it's just a little bit more cinematic. And that's why I love the shallow depth of field. That being said, if I was filming my first wedding, ever, and I had to recommend one lens, it would be this one. Uh, not necessarily this actual lens, but it would be a, a zoom, a 24 to 70 zoom. Why? Because at 24 mil, it's wide enough that it, it gives you a wide angle. And at 70 mil, it's you know, close enough that it gives you that telephoto look. And then you have all the ranges in between. And a wedding day can just throw different things at you. I've been in situations, for example, where I didn't think I was riding in the bride's car and suddenly I was riding in the bride's car or the couple's car, or um, I got to the venue and suddenly it was a lot smaller than I thought it was, or there was just a situation where maybe the bride was getting ready and it was a very tight space. Having a zoom just gave me versatility and it meant I could shoot 24 to 70. Now, now that I'm more experienced, I don't actually like the zoom that much and it's actually my backup lens. Now, this is a Sony G Master 24 to 70. It's the creme de la creme of zooms. When it, with my camera, it's fantastic. The image quality is amazing. Again, with the clear image zoom, it means I get a load of uh, versatility and options and it's a great backup lens to have. And this would be probably my second. If I was starting out, this would probably be the first lens that I buy. But now that I'm a little bit more experienced, it'd probably be the second lens that I buy because I love the look of the prime lenses, right? I love the look of the prime lenses. So first lens that I'd recommend, 24 to 70. If you haven't got one of these, I just recommend having one because it just covers you for every eventuality. Also, you can do a lot of creative things like zoom in and zoom out. And that can be a look if you like it. That's a nice look to have on the dance floor. And I just think when you don't know your style yet, when you don't know and you're not experienced at weddings yet, I just think this is a good fail safe to have in your camera bag. It might, you might like the prime look and want to go straight into shooting primes. That's up to you. I just think I would, I would feel comfortable having this in the camera case um, that I can use as a second lens, like I said. Um, now, my absolute favorite lens is this one. Uh, it's the Sony 50mm 1.2. Um, I love this lens because it just has that cinematic look and it goes down to 1.2, which is like creamy, but it, and creamy bokeh, creamy shallow depth of field. It means hardly anything is in focus, but I just love that look. And when like on sunset, sunset looks or when you're shooting in the right light, this just has a really beautiful cinematic quality to it. And 50, 50 mil focal length. I love the 50 mil focal length because it's the closest to our natural eye in terms of like how we see the world. 50 mil is about right in terms of like, it's kind of telephoto, but at the same time, it's kind of, it can be kind of documentary. So it's wide enough that it gives you a good perspective that you can capture what's going on. But it's close enough that if you want it to be a portrait lens and get those intimate, closer details for B-roll, you can. This is probably the most telephoto lens that I shoot on the 50 mil. I know a lot of people love the 85 mil 1.4. Um, I don't use it because um, I just found it was a bit too close for my style. So I love the 50 mil. So with these two lenses, one on this camera and this on the other camera, I could probably shoot an entire wedding. So the 50 mil would be the one that stays on the camera. Again, we're gonna show in the ceremony, It'd probably be the one that I'd use in my hand, handheld. Do shoot handheld. We'll go over those tips of how to shoot handheld. And in fact, yes, so do shoot handheld. So 
this would be on the first camera and then this lens would be on the second camera and it would give me a wide um, or give me a close-up so between these two you could probably film I could probably film a whole wedding and probably you could too and give you a, a good um, versatility but what are the other lenses that I recommend so the other one I would recommend is a wide super wide angle lens so this is my portrait lens but it's also kind of a documentary kind of lens this is my versatile lens and then a super wide angle lens why because this is a 20 mil again Sony 1.8 the quality on this is fantastic. It's super light, so I can throw it in a pocket. I have been known to do that if I want to. Um, on, a lens, on my camera, it's super light. And this is great for ceremony to get that super wide angle. It's great for dance floor when you want to dance up close. Because it's 1.8, it means you can let a lot of light in on the dance floor. You don't want to be that guy holding a light. So I like to shoot a lot of natural light. So 1.8 lets a lot of light in. And it's wide enough when you're shooting close, you can get those details. But also for a lot of ceremonies, it's great when maybe there's not enough space. It gives you a whole wide vista of what's going on. So 20 mil, 1.8. And then the 35 mil, 1.8. I love Sony's 1.8 lenses. The, the reason why they're great bang for your buck. They're almost as good as the, so these are the G Master lenses. In terms of sharpness and quality, most people couldn't tell the difference in terms of the sharpness and quality. They don't go to 1.4, 1.2, but in terms, what they don't do in terms of aperture, in terms of lightness, that is so light and it's so small. The 35mm 1.4 is probably as big as this G Master. This weighs a lot more than this one. Again, this is super easy to just put in your pocket, put in the camera, take it off, take it on, carry it, it's super light. And you're, I've realized by now, the name of the game for me is to be as light and have a, the least amount of footprint as possible. Um, and then, I have this 55 mil because you can never have enough 50s. So because this is my favorite lens, what happens if this, God forbid, should not work? I've got a backup on my 55 mil. Um, 55 mil, uh, 1.8, again, super light. It's as big, you know, these three lenses, where's the 35 mil, put it down here. These three lenses I can kind of hold in my hand. They're light in terms of the size. They weigh about the same, they're super light. You've kept three of them in a timber bag, love them. So love these lenses, highly recommend them. In terms of investment, you know, this is like three, 400 pounds. So, you know, it's not gonna, like this one is like 1,000, this is like two grand, this lens. So, and, and this one is like two grand or something. So, you know, if this falls over, this falls over, which has happened at a wedding. Just gotta live with it, right? Um, that's gonna break your heart, right? Whereas this one falls over, not, so, not as bad. Um, so, but in terms of quality versus weight, the, these are great. So highly recommend. So that's what's in my camera rack. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, five lenses. So between all of them, I've kind of got every focal length covered. I've got my 70 mil if I want to shoot. I'm not really one of those telephoto guys, but if I do, I've got the 70 mil. So I've got 70 mil 24, so my versatile lens. Versatile lens. My go-to lens is the 50 mil 1.2, because I love that cinematic look. And then I have the 35, the 20, my super wide angle, and then the 55 is my backup to this lens. So those are my lenses. Now, thing to note about these lenses, none of them have, I believe, image, I told you it wasn't that technical, but I don't think any of them got Im image stabilization built in. But it doesn't matter because uh, my camera has um, image stabilization. So the Sony a7S III has five stops of image stabilization. And that means I can literally shoot handheld and sometimes if I hold it right, We'll go over technique in the shooting part, but if I hold it right, it's almost like this thing's on a tripod. And again, these are the things I love about the Sony cameras because I think every single Sony camera that they sell, right from the lowest up to the top, has like five levels of image stabilization. So again, that's another thing you want to be thinking about when you purchase a camera. Does it have image stabilization? I know there are a few cameras out there that don't. If not, if it doesn't have image stabilization, that does kind of limit whether you can go handheld or you might have to have image stabilization image stabilization. Can we just say IS, IS in the lens? Uh, but because this has got such good image stabilization, and I can whack that on, and it's gonna give me great, great footage. And then, if there is a little bit of jerkiness, that's where slow-mo comes in. That's why we use slow-mo. Okay, so what else is in my camera? So those are my lenses, those are my cameras. I'm gonna put that over to the side. Um, as you see, it all goes in one case. Um, I'm not that precious about it. Um, 
So that's brilliant. So I'll put that down there. I've got my camera goes in my 10 case. So what else is it? So now we're going to talk about sound. When it comes to sound, I have three options that I use for sound. However, if I was shooting a wedding for the first time again, there's only one option that I would go with. And the reason is, true story, on that first gig in Iceland, I had like this Tascam recorder, which we're going to talk about. And because I wasn't, because it, there's so many buttons on it and I wasn't like knowing which cable to put in, I pressed the wrong button. Thankfully, uh, I got enough audio from the actual camera itself to save it. But because on your first couple of weddings, there's so much to think about, I would want to simplify as much as possible. For me, simplify, simplify, simplify. Number one, simplify. Number two, make everything as lightweight as possible. Those are the two things that you want to, for me, I think are really important. So this is the first option on sound. This is a Tascam recorder. You then need three cables. I have a jack to jack cable, an XLR cable, and a stereo to phono cable. If this is confusing you already, don't worry, confuse me already. And again, it's probably not something you want to think about on your first weddings, but it does offer the best sound, but only if the ceremony, the celebrant at the ceremony and the bride and groom when they're doing their vows and the speeches are using an external mic. That mic will go into a desk. From that desk, you want to take one of these leads, plug it into this Tascam recorder, put an SD card in there and get the feed into this Tascam. You want to make sure it's on line in and the feed from this will be the cleanest audio that you can get. The problem is, is that when you do smaller weddings, not everything will be mic'd. So this thing will then, then be kind of useless. So the second option that you have is a lav mic, which is kind of what I'm wearing a lav mic now. And that lav mic, so this is a lav mic, I have a Rode lav mic. Um, so they come in this case here. So I have two Rode lav mics um, here. Uh, and a lav mic is, is this, look, looks like it's there. That's a lav mic. And that live mic will plug into a digital recorder. Now, the recorder I have now here is, a, I'm going to show you, is a wireless pack. And a wireless pack, I'm just explaining this so you understand what they are. So a wireless pack means it will send a wireless signal to the camera, to our camera operator, Charlie, you know what I mean? Um, and he will be getting the sound into that camera so that when he watches that footage back, he will have that great sound. Now, that is great, but the problem with wireless, um, packs, I'm going to put this pack away. On a wedding, I find that if the groom has had like a mobile phone in their pocket and someone rings or it gets signal, you know that it can interfere with the wireless signal. Sometimes you can get all sorts of frequencies and on a wedding, like in a controlled environment like this, in an interview or recording like this, fantastic, we can use wireless. Uh, where we've got a chance to do a do-over, we can stop, start the action. Weddings, we don't get a do-over. So I don't use a wireless pack. I use this Olympus um, DM670. You can't actually buy them brand new. You can only get one eBay now. But they're great because they are self-standalone uh, self recorders. The lav mic goes in there. Stick this in the groom or the celebrant's pocket. Um, and then I know I'm getting a really nice clean signal. Um, make sure that you stick it on hold so that once you stuck it on hold, once you press record and you stuck it on hold, it kind of means that even if they touch these buttons, you're still going to get the, you're still going to get the recording. And once I put it in there, I can kind of not think about it and it's kind of recording and it's there. Now, word of advice when it comes to audio, you must always make sure you have two sources of audio. Why? Because if this fails, batteries run out, mic comes unclipped. Mic stops working. I don't want to make, I don't want to, or even when I'm using the task cam into the desk, I never want to make sure that this is my only source of audio. Because if that audio goes down, or for some reason the DJ forgot to put the volume up, didn't turn the music off, I need to have a clean source of audio. And so this is where the next thing comes in. And these are my Sony TX6, Sony TX 650s. Again, can't buy them brand new, you can only get them on Amazon now. Don't know if Wex sell them. I don't know if there's another version of them. I think Rode do a similar version of these. But the thing I love about these is these are standalone recorders. The mic is in the top here. The recording goes into here, so it records into here. So there's no SD cards that you need to think about. I think it takes, I think these are like 160 gigabytes. You can do around about 10 hours of recording before it runs out. So it's never, ever going to run out. And to record, 
you simply turn it on, so that's now on, you press record on the side, that's now recording, and I put it on hold, so again, if they touch any buttons, it will not stop recording, and literally, I can clip it on here, and that is now recording me, right? So, now, best still, if you have a pocket, you can clip it on the inside like this, well, not like that, but if I have a shirt pocket, imagine if I had a shirt pocket, it literally can clip on the outside like that, and all you're gonna see is this little top recorder. Most um, grooms or celebrants wear black, so, or a dark colored suit, so even that sticking out of the top pocket is not, it's gonna, it's gonna be inconspicuous. It's as inconspicuous as the lav mic. But the great thing about this, it's still recording by the way. The great thing about this is, um, I don't have to think about anything. I just press record. Imagine you're running into the church, it's late. You, you know, if I have to find the desk, I have to get this out, I have to press it in, I have to test it. Lav mic, I have to take the lav mic, plug it in, in put it inside, test it. Da -da 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 -da. With this, I literally press record. Stick it on. I can't say how many times this has saved my bacon. Now, it's not the best sound. If you're talking in terms of sound quality, this is the best sound, followed by the lav mic into the digital recorder, followed by this. Bad thing about this is it picks up everything, but for speeches and vowels, if you think about it, most times other people aren't talking. However, if you're in a big crowd and everybody's kind of, there's like ambient noise, this is gonna pick it out. This is only gonna pick up what's coming out on the mic. So that's why it's the cleanest source of audio this is going to pick up everything but in a registry office if you think about it most registry weddings very enclosed space just a celebrant is talking just a groom and bride are talking nobody else is making a sound a lot of the times in a registry office i will go with this this recording and it'll be good enough now i have three of these i actually have four because uh, you can never have too many of these um, and they're in my pocket on a wedding day all the time because one goes on the groom, one goes on the celebrant, one goes where the readers are speaking. So if there are any readings, someone's going to a lectern, I'll just literally leave it on the desk in front. This will be good enough, like here on the lectern, if I put it here, this will be good enough to pick up that sound. And then the fourth one is my backup audio. So for example, imagine I'm giving a speech. One will go on the speaker, the other one will go around the mic and it will go around the mic. I don't know if I've got it here. I think I might have it. Don't have it here. Um, basically, I have this piece of elastic that ties it around the mic. So imagine this is on the mic as the speaker's talking. So that's my backup audio. And then one is on the speaker itself. That's my main source of audio. So I know that wherever that mic's going, it's getting backed up. At a wedding, one on the groom, one on the, the celebrant. And then you could put one just close to wherever the ceremony's happening and that's your backup source of audio. Um, so yeah, this is why I love these recorders. So if I was starting a wedding, if I was going back to Iceland and Ibiza and filming those first two weddings again, I would be taking these bad boys with me because so much less to think about, they literally fit in your pocket. And from those weddings, um, the sound would have been good enough um, to pick up the audio. Um, in the end, I was faffing about with all these things and that's why I made mistakes. So once I kind of, got my head around weddings, got enough under my belt, kind of felt a bit more relaxed, I might then upgrade to these, and upgrade to these. The thing about this is like, the lav mic itself costs about 140 quid, and then the recorder costs 60 pounds. These cost 90 pounds, um, and everything's built in. So, I'm good to go. So, 160 plus the 40, a load of things that can go wrong, um, and that has, hap that has happened as well, where the mic, um, the connection between the mic, every time the groom moved, it, it was cutting out and then I lost the audio there. Thankfully I had the backup. So these are usually my backup sources of audio and my main sources of audio if it's a small enclosed space. So highly recommend those. Now, in my other camera bag, in my other camera bag are all my batteries. I bring nine batteries. Now again, the great thing about shooting when you shoot with the same camera, um, is that they will take the same batteries and I have nine batteries. Might sound like a little bit of overkill, but I do not want to be charging batteries at a wedding. So I want to know with nine batteries, that's more than enough for most weddings, most situations. I've got two cameras. So um, even if I have to have three cameras, sometimes I have three cameras at a wedding, I know that I can, I've got enough batteries to cover me for the whole day. And the great thing again about these cameras is they use battery power quite well, they're quite efficient. Um, and so these batteries are the same across the whole line of Sony. So no matter what, if I've got Sony camera, I can use the, the same battery. 
So that's what I love about um, having these batteries. So I always have nine. So again, it's not something I think about. It means I, it's a bit of a pain charging them before the wedding, um, but it just means on the wedding day, I'm not thinking about it. Now, the last thing in my uh, case is, is I have a gimbal. So I have a Ronin RSC2. Um, I call it the gimbal of love because <laughs> the gimbal of love seeks out love wherever it goes. Now, why would you have a gimbal? A gimbal is for those cinematic shots. Um, and so the way a gimbal works is you attach the camera to the gimbal and it means that you can get cinematic footage because once you turn it on, it gets cinematic footage. Now, that being said, on my first wedding, I had a gimbal and it got in the way. So if I was starting out, I wouldn't use a gimbal. And the reason being, it's another thing to think about. You've got to figure out, is it balanced? Is it working? Is it charged? And again, on your first few weddings, you don't want things cluttering up your mind. So on my first wedding, I wouldn't have used this. I wouldn't have brought this. It wasn't needed. Um, everything was, every, in the end, everything that I shot and used was all handheld. So uh, because it was my first wedding, I didn't know, you know, I was going around and we would go to different locations. It was way, in the end, it was way easier just to have this with, a, with one lens on it. I think it was even a zoom lens. And it was way easier to have that than it was to have this thing. And then the other thing is like you're there and then you like, have I got it? I've got to pick up. So this is great once you kind of advanced a little bit, but when you first started, I wouldn't use a gimbal. But that's the other thing that's in my camera bag. So that's everything in my camera bag. Now, the last thing that I take on a wedding are these camera stands. Now, why do I take light stands? Oh, sorry. Why do I take light stands? Because I have a light. Sorry, this is the last thing in my camera bag. So I have this light. It's a Unoa YN216. It costs about 60 pounds. And it takes a normal kind of, these kind of batteries and you just slot it like that. And then that's the light. There you go, that's the light working. It's bright enough, as you can see, for if it's a dark speeches or first dance or night, I'm gonna get a creative look that I can get loads of <laughs> different creative looks. Um, and it's bright enough that if I wanna light the cake or anything like that or get some B-roll, it's good enough. And, but it's cheap enough that if I should drop it, I can just buy another one. Great thing about this is um, it's, uh, it's got color temperature, so I can go a bit yellow. Is that going yellow? I, yeah, so yellow, so I can go warmer, and I can go whiter, um, and I can control the power on it. Um, but again, it's bright enough that it can do most things that I need, and it's cheap enough that if I should drop it, I'm not gonna lose any sleep over it. Now, back to the light stands. So I carry light stands because A, for the light, but as you're gonna see when we do the shooting section, one of your cameras will most likely always need to be on a tripod. Now, the thing about tripods is that they are cumbersome and nothing screens more than videographer than having a tripod. Now, the thing about a tripod is um, it's got three legs in it. You've gotta get it out, you've gotta set it up, you've gotta carry it and that's great because it gives you very stable footage. But most of the times, at most weddings, people aren't running around. And with the cameras that I use are so light, and with the prime lenses, I found that a light stand is good enough to carry, um, to carry the camera. Now we're gonna show you on the shooting section exactly how that looks when it's set up. But you can see how light, now this is a carbon fiber light stand. Um, you can get it on eBay, it's probably about 50, 60 pounds. It is super light, that three of these in my bag. Um, Charlie, the cameraman, is filming this when he, when he when he saw it, like how light it was. If I go on a train, I could sling this over my shoulder. It's not heavy, but it's strong enough that it can carry. In fact, this camera right now that's filming us is on a light stand. It's got a 35, is that a 28, 28 mil lens? It's got 24 mil lens on it. Um, it's a Sony a7S III, it's on a light stand. And this is mimicking what a speech would be like at a wedding. Most people won't, will be sitting down, so they're not rushing around. At a ceremony, most people are sitting down. It's perfect, it's stable, it's not moving, it's not going anywhere, it's quite robust. The only thing you've got to be careful about is if you raise it too high, it could fall over. If there are kids running around, it could get knocked over. 
But most of the times, like I said, when I'm going to use it at a wedding, kids aren't running around at a ceremony. They're not running around speeches. If you're worried about that, surround it with a couple of chairs, put it in a very safe place in the corner. It's probably not going to get disturbed. No one's going to touch it. Probably going to be at the back of the room or in a ceremony at the front. No one's going to interfere with it. And so I use these light stands for my camera. I have three of them, one for each camera, should I need it, and then one for the light if I need it. And again, they're super, super light. I can carry three. So on top of the light stand, I have this Manfrotto swivel head. Um, and that's great because, again, it's the right screw for the bottom of the camera. I can put the camera on it. Uh, but also it means I can move the camera around and gives me versatility. So I kind of like that. The only, see, the only trouble if you didn't have the swivel head, you'd have to put it straight on the stand. And it means then I can't adjust it, can't adjust the camera. But with these swivel heads, I can, uh, I can adjust the uh, camera any way I want. And it uh, gives me, and it tightens up and it's great. And it's really light, really flexible. And three of these fit into this Manfrotto bag. And seriously, they, they probably weigh less than one normal Manfrotto light stand. Um, and I can't say how much of a game changer that has been. Um, although Charlie's just knocked that stand and it's just, <laughs> so you gotta be careful about that. Um, so they are a little bit light. Um, if you're worried about that, then use a tripod. There's no way of getting around it. Tripod's gonna be better. Shaky floor, use a tripod. I've just found in most situations, the light stand is good enough. Um, so that's what I would use. So that's everything in my camera bag. Now, the only other things I need to go over is when I get back home, I have a laptop. At the moment, I edit on a MacBook 16 inch uh, M1 maxed out uh, laptop. The reason I have a laptop is because I can connect it into an external screen. Don't have it with me because I don't really bring my laptop to weddings, but I can plug it into a TV and edit off a screen monitor, but also it's portable enough that if I want to go to a coffee shop, if I had a destination wedding, I can take it with me, I can edit. Now, the only thing to talk about editing is uh, two things. You need to have good source of backup. So this is my Lacey drive. Um, it's a rugged Lacey drive. The reason I love it is because it's rugged. If you drop it, it's probably protected. It's, I don't know if it's waterproof, but it's pretty rugged. It's pretty good. Um, now I have three of these. So when I get home, I take my USB-C cable, which goes into my Sony camera on the port here. The other great thing about the Sony a7S III is it's fast transfer data. So I plug it in there. Again, I never take my camera cards out. So I, I know this camera for this wedding. I plug it into my laptop. Then another cable goes out, USB-C to USB-C. So I just need to load a USB-C cables to my, my, my um, hard drive. I can plug two cameras into my laptop. Both of them transfer data to this hard drive. I probably do that as soon as I get home from a wedding, does that overnight. When I get back up in the morning, I then clone this to another drive. And then, yeah, just clone it to another drive. This drive will always stay at home. And the other drive will always go with me wherever I go. Sounds like overkill, but the last thing you want to do is lose a wedding. Okay, so go out for a meal. It's easy enough. It's rugged. I take it, leave it in the car. Uh, go around to my parents' house, just take it, go on holiday, take it, chuck it in the suitcase. I know wherever I go, I've got uh, a backup of my weddings, so I, should, I would never lose it. I cannot tell you how many horror stories I've heard about people who shot their first couple of weddings and then lost the footage because either A, they've got to back it up, uh, their drive, their main drive that they had, they, um, it corrupted, uh, they forgot to transfer the cards over. They took the cards out of the camera, then forgot that they, they you know, so many horror stories. Um, and that's going to be very hard to get over. It's going to be harder to get over losing the footage um, than, you know, just having a good, staying up a little bit extra and having a good backup system and having the awkwardness of just carrying this wherever you go. Like I'd rather, like it's, it's, it's nothing. Like I can stick it in my bag. It's like I stick it in my pocket sometimes or my jacket pocket. It's nothing. And most of the times it stays in the car when we go on, on the car. And it's just great to have, and I know wherever I go that I've got that. So USB-C cable. And then the last cable that I have is this USB, is it micro SD connector to USB? That goes in the dongle and that goes into my computer. And then this goes into uh, my Sony TX. 
650. So it goes, literally goes into the bottom, plug that into the computer. And because this records in MP3 and not like WAV, literally takes seconds to transfer over like a whole speech. Brilliant. Um, and so that's what I would do. So what, final thing, when it comes to coming home and transferring all this footage, um, how do I do it? So basically I would have a folder on this drive by the name of the couple. So it could be Charlie and Victoria, or you could do it date Charlie and Victoria. So then it all goes in chronological order when you're looking at all your weddings that you're shooting. And then within that folder, I have one folder called camera one, and I'll have all the footage from camera one, one folder called camera two, and I have all the footage from camera two, and then one folder called sound, and it'll have all the sound. And then I know within that one folder, I have everything that I need for the wedding. And depending on what software you use, you can then transfer that in. And it's very easy to check. Like I know, for example, camera two will always be my on the tripod, on the light stand camera, and camera one will always be the one that's in my hand. So if I want to check, do I have all the speeches or the ceremony, it's really easy to go into the folder of camera two and check it. Can you imagine if you had it all in one folder, you can't see where everything is. So that's really easy to check. And then sound again is in its own sound uh, folder. So you might want to label that. So for example, when you transfer them over speeches, you might want to have a speeches folder and then a ceremony folder. Again, that just makes it easier to check files when you're editing. Um, so it pays to be a little bit more pedantic at that end. And it'll save you a load of pain at the other end. So I like to, when I get home, just check I've got all the speeches. So in the sound folder, have a um, speeches folder, ceremony folder. So very quickly I can check I've got everything I need and it's very easy to access and know where everything is. So that concludes what's in my camera bag. Hopefully that's gone over everything that you need. You can see it's quite messy. Don't worry, I tidy it up after every wedding. Um, again, this is, has a very light, once it's all buttoned up, it's a very light footprint and I can get in and off a train quickly, in and out of a car quickly. So that concludes this section. This is everything that's in my camera bag. Again, as I say, for me, I want to simplify and I want to make sure everything is as light as possible. Just makes it easier for me on the wedding day and as easy as uh, things are to use. It's one less thing to think about and worry about. Um, and so I hope that's been informative and I hope that's given you um, food for thought when it comes to you choosing the kind of gear that you'll be using when you shoot your weddings.